Welcome everybody. I think we'll just give a minute or two. The numbers are flying up here of people joining. Okay, I think maybe we should start unless any of my colleagues indicate not. So welcome everybody. My name is Steve Godfrey. I work for GAIN. It's my pleasure to welcome you to this uh, webinar on aligning business reporting on nutrition for better accountability. Um, you know, as everybody probably knows, next week there's going to be an explosion of uh, discussion and activity at the UN Food System Pre-Summit ministerial level meeting where all kinds of organizations, government, civil society, indigenous, private sector, will be managing and discussing a whole explosion of new ideas to make our food system more fit for purpose, better for people, better for planet. And I think that the importance of this discussion today couldn't be any greater, because obviously to make sense of change, to be able to measure it, and for those who are pushing for progressive change to get recognition and awareness of that, you have to be able to measure it. So the accountability um, term is really a, a, a way to talk about how we measure uh, our performances uh, uh, in this area of making food systems more nutrition friendly. And so that's everything from you know, responding to the current hunger crisis. I'm sure, like me, you're all horrified by the Sophie figures on the number of chronically hungry going up, the impact of COVID, where we know obesity and overweight have been really important, diet-related NCDs are really important in resilience of people. Um, and, you know, making sure that when we uh, think about how to improve our food system, we not only think about getting better foods to people, but also trying to curb some of the more damaging elements, um, salt, sugars and fats that are contributing to poor diets. So real pleasure to be with you today. This webinar is an effort of, of four, four kind of institutions. Uh, the Consumer Goods Forum, I'm sure you're aware, it's the main, main association of the food and, uh, um, food and beverage uh, kind of uh, companies in all aspects of the food system. Uh, ATNI, that's pioneered much of the work around accountability. Uh, Nutrition Connect, the, 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 the platform for discussing nutrition and food and ourselves gain. So I think what we know for sure is that having looked at the work over the last two years that this group has done together, this is a complex task, but it's also a really important one. So I'm gonna now hand over to my colleague, Lorraine Aubert, who has been leading our work for GAIN, who will take us through the initiative and the objectives. Lorraine. Great, right, thank you, Steve. So we'd like to share with you today um, the results of a GAIN consultative initiative that we did around aligning business accountability in nutrition. Um, so in 2018, what we did is we looked at um, basically a review of a landscape for business accountability in nutrition, and we tried to identify ways to improve that. Um, and having seen gaps and opportunities, we decided to focus on aligning business reporting in nutrition for existing assessment frameworks and methodologies as a way to have more credible um, impact reported, um, have an impact that we could more easily understand and potentially compare across companies, countries or portfolio, for example. And so we had consultations for survey, for bilateral discussions, also through uh, workshops organized with Consumer Goods Forum. And uh, we published the results of the survey. And in January 2021, we published the results of the overall initiative and of all the qualitative comments we received um, and all the discussions and research we had conducted. And so focusing on this alignment of reporting frameworks, uh, through reporting frameworks and methodologies, you can see on the middle column the frameworks and methodologies that were pre-selected for the 2020 survey. And we had around 30 respondents, mostly private sector, you know, has assessing how these um, existing frameworks and tools could be used for business to report their impact in the category on the left side. And on the right column, you have the final 
kind of frameworks and methodologies um, that were listed in the report based on the um, votes we received, but also a lot of qualitative comments. So if we looked at the first category, which is product reformulation, health star rating emerged as um, the key frameworks out there that could be used to report business impact on product reformulation. It has the benefit of having involved public and private sector in its development, and it's also it's already used by um, accountability mechanisms such as the Access to Nutrition Global Index. However, it does require <clears throat> significant resources um, for companies to use it if they have a large portfolio. And, and it also has some leaves, some gaps. So what we advise is that you could have qualitative information and or regional recognized methodologies, for example, NutriScore, to complement ratings from companies um, through health star rating. On marketing to children, what emerged from the discussion is that the most consensual frameworks um, to assess business impact was the Children Food and Beverage Advertising Initiative and the EU Pledge. So there are two voluntary initiatives from the private sector that set criteria on marketing to children for children under 12. Um, and so they're widely used already in the US and Europe, obviously have a strong endorsement for the private sector. However, there is a question on how we can use that beyond those two regions because there weren't any criteria define uh, for global impacts. So that's, um, that's still a question on how that would work um, to go beyond those regions. And for some public stakeholders, um, obviously you have other frameworks that can be more stringent, um, such as the WHO nutrient profile models. So that could be something um, to work towards too for business reporting, just to raise the standards um, for business practices in this area. On food labeling, the consensus was around the use of Codex Aliments various standards on food labeling. Um, strong consensus on using them. I think the one minor issue that was reported was the fact that these um, standards are for global practices. Um, therefore, in high income countries where you have um, a lot of regulations around food labeling, you can have, uh, these can be less stringent than those regulations. Workforce nutrition is an area we looked at and at, at the start there wasn't necessarily a um, specific framework or reporting tool that could address that gap, but the Workforce Nutrition Alliance call card that was developed recently addressed that issue and enables business to report on um, their workforce nutrition impact. Um, however, this is a new tool, so this needs to be disseminated and um, we need to see how accountability mechanisms and businesses start using that to report their impact. It's also a self-assessment tool. And so the, the idea is, is to look at third party verification and ways to make the impact reported through that uh, framework credible. On food safety, um, we looked at the Global Food Safety Initiative benchmarking requirements as a potential ways for businesses to report impact in this area. Um, there you have the benefit of that being a, an initiative widely used by the private sector and to be designed um, for global usage yeah. for specific regions. However, while companies invest in complying with GFSI's audit requirements already, Many of them do not share publicly their detailed impact in this area. So there is a question on how to incentivize companies to actually report on, on their food safety impact. And the last category where we identified an existing reporting tools or frameworks um, to assess business impact is around food loss and waste with a food loss and waste standard developed both by public and private sector, but we didn't have specific targets to assess performance Therefore, the recommendation was to look at SDG 12.3 around halving um, global food loss and waste as a way to basically set, um, set recommendations on, on the performance. What we um, see around the use of these existing reporting tools and frameworks is that it requires a multi-stakeholder effort. And businesses can do that um, by self-reporting using these existing frameworks or at minima external recognized frameworks rather than creating their own baselines or methodologies that are not necessarily easy to understand in terms of actual impact. 
Governments can also use these frameworks to implement regulations in areas where there aren't any, for example. So this is more aligned. Um, and they can support funding for independent accountability and frameworks. Accountability mechanisms also can play a role by using these um, tools and frameworks for alignment um, and sharing data when they do so uh, among themselves or publicly. And finally, NGOs can also play a role uh, around incentivizing companies and accountability mechanisms to basically being held accountable using this set of reporting frameworks. In the end, more aligned business reporting will require multi-stakeholder effort. And what we wanted to show with this initiative is this can start now. These are all existing tools and frameworks. There is no need to wait for a new mechanism out there to be started. All stakeholders group can act around aligning business reporting uh, from today onwards. And finally, over the long term, better business accountability and nutrition will be achieved by making sure we keep these frameworks and methodologies relevant. We also invest in independent assessments. And finally, that we ensure that businesses are all accountable across the entire food value chain and wherever they are for the safety um, and the benefit of consumers and individuals wherever they live. So thank you for, for, that present, for listening to that presentation. Uh, we will share that afterwards with um, the reports that were mentioned. Um, and so now um, we'll have um, the great insight from the Access to Nutrition Initiative on the cost benefit of aligning business reporting in nutrition through their program director, Mara Bumsa. Thank you very much. I'm opening the presentation now. Yes, can you all see it? Good. Okay, thank you. And also uh, welcome on behalf of ATNI. My name is Maria Bomsma and I'm a program director um, with ATNI. Um, let me first quickly um, say a few words on, on uh, ATNI's mission. Um, ATNI, since um, 2013, the first global index um, launch. Uh, that was initiated by GAIN and then uh, the Access to Nutrition Foundation was set up in 2013 um, with the mission to develop and deliver tools uh, to monitor the contribution of the food and beverage sector um, in uh, fighting uh, malnutrition. Um, and um, our role is to, to hold companies accountable, but also to share uh, the outcomes of the indexes um, with, first of all, the companies uh, share best practices to uh, motivate companies to, uh, to invest more in nutrition, but also to share um, knowledge uh, and data with, with uh, other nutrition stakeholders who then use uh, the outcomes of the indexes for their work. Uh, for instance, uh, the investor signatories of ATNI that uh, then use data and outcomes uh, in their discussions with, uh, with the companies that they invest in. Um, we have uh, five work streams. We, uh, first of all, I already mentioned, um, develop global indexes where we assess the largest uh, food and beverage companies globally on, on nutrition. Uh, that also uh, includes uh, BMS assessments for companies that produce baby food. Um, we have published in 2013, 2016, 2018, and two weeks ago, the fourth uh, global index was, uh, was published. Um, we also do country initiatives. So we have uh, done country uh, indexes in uh, two in India already, and we are preparing for the second one in the US. Um, we are uh, expanding that not only um, with regards to food and beverage manufacturers, but we also um, try to uh, expand to other types of companies. So for instance, we're testing a nutrition tool in Nigeria and India for small and medium enterprises together with GAIN and, and some business networks. Um, but we're also preparing for the first UK retail index that will be launched um, next year. Um, the third uh, stream is that we uh, increasingly develop monitoring tools and data for third parties. So for instance, we are working together with World Benchmarking Alliance and share publicly available nutrition data of the companies that we assess, but also uh, we're working with the World Health Organization, for instance, to monitor companies' commitments and to report back to them. Um, and we do action research, the fourth work stream, where we develop new knowledge and data because of course, 
uh, knowledge and, and, and awareness and, and um, all kind of nutrition topics require more in-depth analysis sometimes, particularly when global uh, standards and, uh, and, and guidelines are non-existent. Um, so that's why we're also looking into workforce nutrition, for instance, not only within the companies, but in the whole supply chains. And um, the last year we've developed four reports on the uh, responses to COVID-19 by the food and beverage uh, industry. And we're launching uh, the fourth and last um, stock taking report next week during the pre-summit uh, of UNFSS. Our fifth, fifth working stream is our work with institutional investors. I already mentioned it. This group of, of uh, investors is growing. Um, and it's a really important uh, partner uh, for HNI to use our data and to influence companies uh, to, to respond to outcomes of the indexes. Then to the methodolo uh, methodological framework, um, because indeed, um, like Lorraine was um, already referring to, to the several uh, tools to monitor companies on um, we also use uh, well several of the international policies and norms and guidelines are the basis of our methodological framework. Um, we have uh, seven categories that we assess the companies on, plus then uh, BMS, where we assess baby food companies on um, the BMS, uh, whether they comply with the BMS code of WHO for marketing uh, breast milk substitutes. Um, and as you can see, uh, several of the categories, for instance, category A, where we assess companies on governance, uh, are uh, linking up to global standards, such as the WHO Global Action Plan for the Prevention and Control of Non-Communicable Diseases, the SDGs in products uh, in category B, which is assessing companies' uh, product profiles. We um, do an assessment of companies' um, uh, products, uh, what they, what, what they uh, communicate on, on their uh, labels, um, and we assess their healthiness by using the HealthStar rating um, system. Uh, in marketing, we look at whether companies um, refer to the International Chamber of Commerce Code for marketing to all consumers, but also we use the EU, EU pledge and the CFBI policies on marketing to children, um, etc. We, uh, all the categories are, uh, are divided in uh, indicators that, um, first of all, assess what are companies' policies and strategies, which is one group of indicators. The second one is how they perform um, based on these policies. And the third one is disclosure. So what kind of reporting exists? How much do they disclose? Um, and that is very an, a very important uh, aspect, of course, to be able to, to keep uh, companies accountable uh, on their efforts. Um, if you then look at the impact of the indexes over time, there's two ways of looking into this. First of all, you can look at the, uh, the scoring and how that developed. And then secondly, of course, on, on the actions that, have, uh, that companies have, have, uh, have done. Um, so first of all, the impact over time in numbers. Um, we do see a slight increase in, uh, in the highest scores on the, on the indexes. So the score is from uh, zero till 10. That goes up bit by bit. Um, of course, we do uh, every index, we do uh, assess whether the methodology needs to be um, adjusted based on new knowledge and new developments in the nutrition uh, area. Um, so that has also an impact on score. So on the one hand, you can look at how do companies develop over time. On the other hand, you also have to really see this index as a comparison between the companies at that time um, uh, relatively to each other. Um, also company engagement is going up, which um, um, we can see by the numbers um, there. And the average score and governance, I added this here because um, we do see that companies that have a strong governance system, so where they have good, where they have included nutrition strategies um, and in their management systems and in their reporting systems overall do better in the whole index and in nutrition in all the categories. Um, then um, we also see that companies that engage more, that disclose more information, 
um, are uh, doing better in the in the uh, indexes. So, for instance, Friesland, Campina, Alla, and Meiji, they've shown a big increase in score over time. Where in the first time that they were assessed, they didn't uh, uh, disclose so much information and were not so engaged. But over time, they developed and improved more policies and commitments, which they also shared uh, with us. And that um, that really had an impact on uh, on on also their their score and ranking, but more importantly, of course, on the activities that they develop on nutrition. Um, still, you can of course say that an average score of three point three or three point six, if you compare the same companies in twenty twenty one with the companies in twenty eighteen, is uh, well still leaves a lot of room for improvement. Um, on the other hand, we do see examples uh, where companies are doing better. Um, considering the time, I'm not going to uh, walk uh, through all the, the um, examples, but just to name a few. Um, we do see that uh, 13 of the 25 companies in 2021 compared to 2018 improved their score on nutrition governance and nutritional governance. So that's category A, which we find important because that also then uh, often means that they do overall better. Um, we do see companies uh, on our uh, product profiling assessment where we assess the healthiness of companies products in nine markets. Uh, nine of the companies showed an increase in the mean healthiness of products. So that, that, is, uh, that is a good sign. Overall, however, um, of all the companies, only 31% of the products uh, met the health star rating uh, standard meaning um, that you have to have a score of three and a half or more um, in the HSR. Um, companies, more companies adopted a new nutrition profiling model, um, which um, overall since 2013, we had about 12 companies with a nutrition uh, profiling model. We now have 14 and we do see improvements and we do see that companies uh, develop smarter and, and, and more concrete um, reformulation targets, for instance. Um, but where the biggest changes were made was in uh, the fortification approach of companies. So in 2018, there were only four companies that made a formal statement on their fortification approach in line with Codex. Uh, and now there are nine. Um, and also with regards to uh, labeling claims, this, uh, more companies are committed to that. Um, and lobbying positions, that was a big change as compared to 2018 too, had lobbying positions on nutrition topics in 2018 versus 12 in 2021. Then lessons learned. Um, there are, um, the, the index, what it shows is that, that it gives good insights on, on how the industry is doing relatively compared to each other. That of course, um, uh, well, gives companies an incentive uh, to, to also invest or to, to learn from best practices to do better than their peers. Um, and uh, a good thing is that then indeed investors and other stakeholders can use the data to uh, also discuss um, nutrition. And of course, investors do, do this not only on nutrition, but also uh, on, on environmental um, uh, topics uh, and, and a wider sustainability uh, impact uh, agenda that they have um, to, to influence companies and to move them uh, to, uh, to, to more sustainable business. Um, there are limitations and opportunities. Um, so companies that uh, the index and the results very much depends on, on uh, what companies share. Um, so the opportunity is really to push and, and, and demand companies to, do, to disclose more and be transparent because that uh, makes it uh, easier to, to track what companies are doing and also to influence them to do better. Um, then performance, of course, is much harder to uh, assess than uh, a policy or a commitment because how do you then assess that, that uh, this policy is implemented in all markets? Um, ATNI therefore has developed uh, over the last couple of years various tools to do more in country assessments, for instance, the country indexes, but also product profiling is a typical uh, performance uh, tool to assess, um, well, do companies indeed um, um, implement the, the, the product uh, targets that they have? Are they 
producing uh, healthier food, etc. Um, then comparing companies with different portfolios or in different markets, uh, that also requires that you do more specific analysis uh, in different markets and um, also on different um, uh, in different categories, for instance, which we do in the product profiling, where we uh, compare companies in the same uh, sector. Um, and then the final limitation or limitation, it's, it's definitely more an opportunity or challenge where we indeed uh, have sometimes conflict between global standards and national legislation. And that very much um, aligns with what Loren was saying, that it is important to promote and align uh, standards and guidelines among nutrition stakeholders, including the accountability organizations. Final slide. Um, so what are then the recommendations for, for companies uh, on reporting and disclosure? Um, well, again, uh, to, I'm, I'm repeating myself, but to commit to following international policies, norms and guidelines, um, to really develop more concrete uh, strategies and, and be um, concrete in, in, in setting targets, targets so that we can indeed uh, see how companies are developing over time disclose more policies and report uh, and nutrition data. So for instance, for, for uh, ATI, um, we, um, we work, we're working with the companies to indeed assess the company's nutrition data on, on products for our uh, product profiling, which is very important and gives us a lot of good insights um, and also commit and apply policies programs, not only in home markets, but in all markets uh, globally. Um, Final conclusion, indeed, um, we strongly believe uh, in, in our theory of change that uh, keeping companies accountable by assessing um, their, uh, their uh, reports and um, data uh, really helps us in, uh, in, in impacting nutrition. And we therefore also uh, call uh, to, to work on this uh, with the accountability mechanisms, uh, be efficient there. And um, yeah, I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mariah. Thank you for this presentation. Um, over to Sara Posa, a research analyst from the World, World Benchmarking Alliance, um, to comment on the presentation and on the work of WBA. Yes, I thank you so much. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Sara Posa, and I'm a research analyst at the World Benchmarking Alliance. In the last month, I've been working with my colleagues at WBA on developing the methodology of the Food and Agriculture Benchmark, whose first results will be published next September at the UN Food Systems Summit. First of all, I just wanted to thank GAIN for inviting us and asking us to share our perspective, uh, the reports and the consultative process from this initiative on aligning this reporting mission have been incred incredibly helpful for us in the development of the methodology as one of the core principles of WBA is aligning with existing initiative and reporting frameworks. So with this intervention, I just wanted to um, talk a bit more, uh, more about our baseline study that we did um, um, last winter. So we, we, conducted, we conducted this baseline study on the 350 companies in scope uh, of our benchmark. This was a sort of temperature check to sort of understand where food companies stand in terms of uh, reporting on nutrition. And um, this baseline sh uh, study showed that the majority of companies struggle to identify how they can contribute to urgent health and nutrition challenges. And many companies actually lacked a comprehensive strategy for improving access to healthy foods. So while we, we see that there are many companies that are taking steps to address nutrition issues, they're formulating commitments, there is still a lack of understanding of some, of some nutrition issues, specifically of what kind of data or information they should, be, they should disclose. So, and this is particularly evident when we look at the companies across the food value chain. So we, we think that accountability mechanisms can play a very important role in guiding business uh, reporting on nutrition. And we also do realize that companies across the food value chain are different and might have different impact on nutrition. Also the national context, um, they also like also play a role there. So it can become quite challenging to, to think of sort of global reporting standards that work well for, for all the companies in context. But however, we, we, we certainly see the benefits of improved coordination and alignment among the different accountability tools. 
Uh, one of them, for example, is the reduction of the reporting burden for companies. And more importantly, we think it's essential to keep working together and like among all the accountability mechanisms and tool and try to build a clear and robust, uh, clear and robust reporting frameworks to track and measure business impact on nutrition, possibly across all the different stages of the, um, of the food value chain. Thanks. Thank you, Sarah. Um, for the sake of time and because we are a bit behind schedule, I will pass on to the next presentation and we'll be answering questions through the Q&A and in the end. So over to Sharon Bly, who is the Healthier Lives Director for Consumer Goods Forum. Thank you. Super. Thanks a million. And uh, thanks uh, to all my fellow speakers um, for inviting me to join you and to everyone who's um, listening. Um, so what I wanted to, to touch base on is reporting on impact. Uh, what does this uh, look like on the ground? Um, working on, of course, aligning the accountability, but then actually putting it into, um, into action. Um, so the Consumer Goods Forum, and many of you listening are members and many of you are not, but we are 400 businesses um, looking to kind of drive that progressive change that Steve uh, mentioned that is so urgently needed. And how that really happens is all of the people um, working in the companies, whether it's retailers, manufacturers, or their partners, in about 70 uh, markets, trying to uh, look at how that collaboration can have a positive impact in the world. Uh, we work on eight specific areas. I'm going to touch on three of them quickly today, um, trying to make positive change in healthier lives, um, on forest positive, on waste, food and plastic waste, um, sustainable supply chain initiatives, looking after uh, the human rights of people in those supply chains and the data that helps us understand um, how all of this is connected together. So I'm going to quickly touch on how we're looking at impact in food uh, loss and waste, uh, the Global Food Safety Initiative and Collaboration for Healthier Lives that Lorraine uh, mentioned in her presentation at the start of today's session. So if we look at food loss and waste, if we think about those eight coalitions behind each of them um, is a, uh, an entire governance structure and body um, of companies working in a multi-stakeholder environment. And this is the, the roadmap of the Food Loss and Waste Coalition. Um, we created those coalitions, these coalitions to move faster, um, to have sharper commitments, and to really, really focus on this uh, part, which um, is reporting on that impact. And you can see here on this slide, I'll, I'll share, um, we'll be sharing these slides after the presentation, really the, 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 the increase or the focus on harmonizing um, reporting um, really getting that development of the protocol um, on food loss and waste for all of the, the private sector companies that um, we work with, testing it, training companies on understanding um, waste within their operations and then helping them to build um, those goals um, as we move along towards um, uh, meeting the, the SDGs. And you can see what we hope uh, by the end of this year is having all of the members of this coalition reporting publicly um, against the baseline that we've created in um, 2020. And of course, um, any more details that you want um, on what we're doing in this space, I, I'm happy to share them uh, with you because I'm just doing a very uh, quick overview today. If you think about the same in uh, food safety, uh, we've just gone through what we've called in our um, language, a race to the top, um, looking at kind of improving the entire um, food safety uh, ecosystem around the, the world. And again, this has to be done in a, in a multi-stakeholder environment. So what are we doing with um, auditors, uh, with certifi certification program owners, uh, with accreditation bodies, um, looking at different certification platforms, um, putting that into the ground um, uh, and helping uh, large and small companies um, with the global markets program in, in multiple uh, countries and regions around the world. And then of course, working with um, regulators and policymakers um, to drive um, continuous improvement um, in the food, safe, food safety management systems. Um, so overarchingly, it is all around harmonization, capacity building, and as I mentioned, working in a public-private uh, partnership, and all of that really to build trust in uh, the Global Food Safety um, Initiative certification um, uh, schemes, all of the bodies that are working within that ecosystem, and that people know um, that they can trust um, the um, uh, the certification and um, that it's happened um, under the GFSI uh, scheme and body. Uh, then uh, the area that I work in um, is collaboration for healthier lives and, and the, the three, um, let's say, pieces of the, the framework is employees and then looking really at um, consumers and shoppers in both a physical and a digital um, ecosystem. 
Uh, so the first piece of work that we do is really putting our own people at the heart um, of, um, of the framework. And one of those areas is on workforce uh, nutrition. Uh, so the, an alliance was created um, last year uh, with GAIN uh, to really look at how we could drive progress in these four areas. So we looked at evidence um, on um, implementation across these four areas. So building um, more uh, healthy food at work, uh, breastfeeding support, nutrition focused health checks and nutrition education. And what we really found is that if we really build these four pillars of workforce nutrition, uh, we could meet our ambition, which is to uh, impact, not just reach, but impact um, 5 million people by um, 2025. And hopefully using the workplace as a really optimal and efficient way to, uh, to reach people. So how are we going to do that is we've looked at a six step process. Uh, so working with employers, large and small, anywhere in the world around understanding what you already have um, within your, your organization and helping all of those employers to set uh, targets and then develop their implementation plans. Uh, we have actually we just went live um, uh, this month with an implementation uh, support program, and I'll pop the links into, uh, into the chat so you can see what that looks like. Um, there's an entire um, um, uh, now platform set up with uh, multiple free resources and then uh, training courses for those companies who want to deep dive into how they can drive this across their organization. Um, we have set up a, a self-assessment that Loren um, mentioned uh, to help companies to monitor and report uh, their progress. And the team at at and uh, helped us look um, at the questions in, in that tool um, and then work with companies, obviously, to, to have a, a reward system in place to really help uh, drive this forward. So the, uh, the uh, scorecard itself, uh, this is what uh, you will see if you're, you're an employer and you're creating your own dashboard. So it doesn't matter what type of a company you are, you're a retailer, a manufacturer, or other organization um, across the, uh, the food system, uh, you can uh, reach people in multi-site environments, whether that's uh, retail stores, distribution centers, or factories. You can create your own das dashboard to understand um, what this looks like across your organization. Uh, it helps you to either do this, obviously, we, we like to have an ambassador at each company, uh, looking at what you're doing with your own people. You can share this with multiple sites, as I mentioned, across multiple uh, countries. Uh, the tool actually adds up all of your scores and weights them across the, the four areas to help you see where you're performing well and where you probably um, uh, could look for some, uh, some support. And then the Alliance is there to help you work through uh, the scores and how you can improve them uh, over time. Uh, the second uh, part of the framework was around shoppers and consumers and what we're trying to do uh, to firstly progress healthier baskets. So uh, looking really at consumption in, um, in baskets and looking at the whole digital ecosystem. And in particular, um, with everything that happened in the global health pandemic, we've seen uh, a huge amount of acceleration, obviously, in, in e-commerce. And we needed to really ensure that what was done in a physical um, sense was also replicated in the digital environment. Uh, so we have um, programs in the countries that you see here on the map and the light blue is, um, is Russia, which is the latest country to join uh, the Collaboration for Healthier Lives initiative. So how we're trying to look at impact is based on this framework. Uh, so as I mentioned, basket growth, engagement and uh, shared value. So if you're looking at basket growth, we um, CGF, we represent both food and non-food um, companies. Uh, so for personal care and hygiene, how can we look at the percentage growth of household penetration? Um, of the different personal care and, and hygiene goals that we have, whether that is uh, oral hygiene, whether it's smoking cessation, whether it's um, uh, immunity and, and vitamin deficiency. Uh, for the food baskets, we look at uh, low, medium and high impact of growth in the basket of healthier uh, food uh, category choices. So an example of where I live, um, I live in France, uh, Nutri-Score is the reference that we're looking. Uh, so we're tracking in the basket, are we growing Nutri-Score A and B products in the basket? And of course, um, uh, fruit and vegetables. Um, engagement, um, is all of this um, engaging? And in particular, when you think about personal care and, and hygiene, if you're targeting a percentage of the population, whether it's on um, uh, uh, hand, hand washing, whether it's on oral hygiene or smoking cessation that I mentioned, education plays a huge role. Um, in um, uh, moving and, and um, impacting uh, percentages of the, the population. And also we see a new, um, uh, new product categories, that I think in particular around healthier and more sustainable diets, the plant-based movement. Uh, there is a huge element of education that is needed to really drive um, a growth in that area. 
And then based on all of that, are you actually changing behaviors? And so looking at the percentage of people in the basket through loyalty card data, is it actually having an impact? And are they um, uh, adding categories uh, to, to their baskets and changing their behaviors over time? And one very important piece of the puzzle that we uh, don't talk about that, that often and that um, obviously for the sustainability of all of these programs is creating shared value. Uh, for this to be commercially viable is a hugely important piece of our framework uh, because otherwise these projects will not last over time. And so uh, we really try to find the commercial viability of uh, driving this basket growth and engagement um, across our initiatives to ensure that these are not nice projects, but something that really changes business practices over time. Um, and then what we do um, is all of the learnings and reports, um, everything that works and everything that doesn't, because a lot of our interventions do not work. Uh, we publish them all on our website, uh, which is the globallearningmechanism.com. Um, in each country, obviously, health is um, very, very local. Um, and we've seen uh, really you know, working on a, on a local level, despite whatever global um, commitments you make, it is uh, very, very uh, local. Um, so all of those learnings, we share them directly on, um, on our platform. Um, and with that, uh, I'll just leave you with some of our contact details and hand you over to Ava to see if there's any questions now or, of course, later in the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Sharon. Uh, just a question that came through um, to our Q&A book. So it's about uh, whether there is independent evaluation and how do you uh, evaluate and assess those KPIs? Um, so we do. We always strive to have um, independent evaluation and working um, with academia is one of the ways that we, we do that. And so, um, again, I'll take the French um, version um, of Collaboration for Healthier Lives. We work with INSEAD and INRA, um, who are actually evaluating at the, at the moment the, um, uh, the initiatives in, in the UK, for example. We worked with um, the team at Oxford uh, University um, in the US, McGill. So we always do try to have um, uh, an external view or a look on um, uh, on our data, is it having impact? Um, and to help us as well to co-design the initiatives based on the learnings from one year to, um, to the next. And we're probably into, in some of our most mature markets, into our third year um, of learning. So having that um, external viewpoint is, um, is hugely beneficial to us. And we actually welcome it, I would say, having that critical viewpoint on, um, uh, on what we're doing um, and that it's not um, necessarily us evaluating uh, ourselves. I hope that answers the, the question. I can pop in the chat some of those um, reports that we've had from um, academia, if that would be helpful. Great, thank you, Sharon. Now, for the interest of time, I think it's better to um, give the floor to Catherine LeBlanc from Nutrition Connect, um, that will uh, address the long-term challenges. Catherine, over to you. Hey. Thank you very much. I'm actually, so uh, yeah, I'm Catherine LeBlanc. I manage Nutrition Connect, and I'm going to hand over to Emily Grady from the World Business Council on Sustainable Development to get her perspectives on this. Emily? Thank you, Catherine, and thanks so much to the, the game team and everybody else for inviting me to jump in here and share. Um, I've been prompted to share just a few thoughts on the links between better uh, business reporting on nutrition and the two summits coming up later this year, the Food System Summit and the Nutrition for Growth Summit. Um, just briefly, though, I'm Emily Grady with the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, and I largely look after our work on nutrition and consumer behavior change. Um, and I think I'll just start actually by commenting uh, primarily on the Nutrition for Growth Summit, um, which obviously has nutrition as a core remit. Um, and this is a this is a, a summit that's coming up, uh, hosted by the government of Japan, um, and coming up in early December. And um, the Nutrition for Growth Summit is, is focused on eliminating malnutrition in all forms by 2030 and um, inviting, they, they invite constituents from the private sector, from, uh, from, from government, from donors and, and UN agencies to bring forward meaningful commitments um, related to nutrition. And um, one, of the, one of the key attributes of this summit that I think has caught the attention of many and has been seen um, by, by the diverse stakeholders involved as a positive thing is that there were um, principles of engagement put forward, negotiated and put forward by the, the different constituencies. Um, and these principles of, of engagement really help define how people can show up, how companies, governments, and others can show up and bring forward commitments um, to this summit. Um, the, the Global Nutrition Report is, um, has developed in previous uh, Nutrition for Growth Summits a commitment 
tracker. And they were also putting forward, um, they'll, 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 they'll be helping to take care of monit monitoring and assessment of, um, of, of commitments that are brought forward for Nutrition for Growth each year. So uh, companies and other stakeholders that choose to make a commitment this year will, will be asked to report annually to the Global Nutrition Report and, um, and that the, the commitments will then be measured in this way. Um, one thing I'd like to highlight is just that the, the World Business Council, along with the Consumer Goods Forum um, and, and a number of other organizations that are involved in the business constituency group for Nutrition for Growth, have developed a, a commitment framework. It's called the Responsible Business Pledge for Better Nutrition, which is a framework that is designed to help companies bring forward meaningful, smart commitments aligned with the principles of engagement to the Nutrition for Growth Summit. And um, when I'm done speaking, I'd be happy to just drop a link to that uh, pledge in the chat just to give you all a sense of what it is and um, how you might get engaged. I'm also happy to follow up offline on that point. So I think, as I said, for Nutrition for Growth, it's pretty clear how the accountability piece is, is going to be brought forward um, through the, the Global Nutrition Report. For the UN Food System Summit, um, of course, this has a broader remit than just nutrition. And from my understanding, and I had a quick catch up with our um, internally with colleagues who are leading our efforts um, with, with the, the Food System Summit, there's not yet full agreement on what types of reporting mechanisms or accountability mechanisms will be agreed upon as the sort of primary method for, um, for registering or taking forward commitments in the Food System Summit. But I do think um, WBA, so maybe Sarah can jump in later, um, has been involved in thinking through what reporting or accountability could, could look like. Um, one thing I'll highlight is that the, the private sector guiding group of the UN Food System Summit has put forward a business declaration, which is a, a statement of ambition that businesses can take forward, sort of showcasing leadership on food system transformation. And there is language there on the importance of transparency and, and disclosure um, and, and, and clear reporting. And so I think that's a increasingly uh, certainly seen as a primary, um, a, a, a priority, I guess, for, for companies engaging in, in this work. Over the next few weeks, there will be a, an addendum developed to that business declaration, which includes a handful of additional um, commitment mechanisms and reporting frameworks and um, you know, commitment making processes and pledges in order for business to, to show their leadership in a number of different areas related to the food system transformation. Um, and this will also be um, another way for business to continue to show leadership and uh, in the context of, of these big key events. And the Responsible Business Pledge, for example, will be added um, to that as, as an addendum, as well as the, um, the work that FAO is doing to put together a tool to measure private sector contributions to achieving the SDGs and a number of other um, interesting and exciting and, and meaningful um, commitment frameworks that are in the works. So maybe I'll stop there, but very happy to answer questions as we move along. So Catherine, back to you. Thanks so much. Thanks, Emily. Really appreciate that. Um, before we open it up to q and I just wanted to share two quick slides that we have from our colleagues from the um, Global Nutrition Report. As Emily mentioned, they've been doing a lot of work around monitoring and tracking um, commitments for um, nutrition from growth, but also more broadly. So I just want to share a couple slides on one of their um, new initiatives that they have coming up that's building on this work. So let's see. Hopefully you can all see my screen. So um, yes, uh, the Global Nutrition Report is working on a new initiative called the Nutrition Accountability Framework, which is, which is aimed at um, driving stronger nutrition action across um, stronger nutrition action and accelerate progress to make tackling poor diets and all forms of malnutrition a winnable fight across geographies and sectors. Again, as Emily has sort of pointed out, this is building on their existing um, experience doing that. And they also emphasize that this is not something that they can do alone and invite all kind of stakeholders to support and um, get on board with as well. So the idea um, there would be um, to end poor diet, 
ending poor diets, but we need a you know comprehensive framework for accountability, um, which is what we have been talking about here. Um, I will share the link that they have there that talks a little bit more about the value proposition for this new framework that they discussed. So I'll pop that in the chat afterwards. And then just ways that you can get involved um, are, again, reading through that, that link that, or the information that's in that link that I'll share with you. Um, and also just sharing more broadly um, across your own networks and social media platforms, some of the work that um, GNR has been doing. So I think that's it, but again, I'll pop that link in on the NAF so you guys can all look through that. And then I will just quickly check the, it does not look like there are any specific questions necessarily for Emily, but more broadly, there have been a couple questions that kind of come in around SMEs and suppliers to CPG companies. Um, so I was wondering maybe if, um, Sharon, if you have any answers to that, Maria um, has already answered a question about the burden of reporting for SMEs, but also kind of somewhat perhaps linked to that is how suppliers to CPG companies can support and engage in these efforts. So I was wondering, Sharon, maybe working with businesses, um, the Consumer Goods Forum, if you have any kind of additional responses to those questions. Yeah, so I think, I mean, we are a global organization, but, you know, all of this implementation happens at a at a local level. And so each and every time um, we do work towards, um, you know, the, these global commitments and global uh, developments, we do um, test all of these protocols, uh, methodologies with um, uh, with SMEs. Um, we have trainings, whether it's on, in the Global Markets Programme, um, whether it's on, on healthier lives or workforce nutrition, everything is built basically um, so that no matter what size company you, um, you, you are across the, uh, the food system or the value chain, um, that you find your, your, your place. Um, and we do hear that. I think the whole initiative when uh, GAIN started, um, all of this was based on some of the feedback on the burden, the duplication, the multiple um, asks and requests from companies, in particular smaller organizations, on, um, on reporting. So I think we have um, progressed somewhat, but there's probably still uh, more that can be done in the space. But normally the way um, um, you know, these tools are, are, are built and all of the capacity building pieces of the puzzle that we put in place are done so that it, is, it becomes um, doable for, for all types of um, organizations. Thanks, Sharon. Um, just on that, Loren, do you have any, you know, with your work with the Sun Business Network over the years and GAIN, who does focus on small businesses as well in the nutrition kind of space, food nutrition world, can you, um, do you want to add anything there on kind of how this reporting can benefit SMEs at all? Um, yeah, so we are actually planning to uh, release a brief of around 10 pages to go into more details on how the results of that initiative are also relevant for SMEs. Um, and if I just look at a few key points where I identify where align reporting could benefit them. Uh, one of the first key one is trade. Um, a lot of these SMEs are looking at how they can, you know, be suppliers to larger companies or access new markets. And so if they are already, they have set standards, for example, around food safety, and they share um, how they comply to certification programs, that's a way to be um, ready for to access these new markets um, and also to reassure potential um, large companies that are buying um, their products, um, which are often going for a lot of scrutiny in terms of the overall supply chain and the impact. Um, one of the, the other point is in a lot of low and middle income country where you have um, SMEs providing most of the food, you don't necessarily have a lot of regulations there, but they're increasing. And so by looking at kind of global standards and requirements that you have um, largely, that's a great way for these smaller companies to prepare for these upcoming regulations and then to potentially be more competitive. And obviously that's also very beneficial for kind of trust and visibility in general towards consumers, investors, where you can show that maybe compared to over national companies, SMEs in these countries, um, you are already looking at your impact around nutrition and you're looking at doing that through kind of external credible frameworks out there. Great, thanks so much, Lauren. Um, I, I know we're about to wrap up, so I'm gonna hand it over to Steve, but I just wanna say for anybody on the line who has a question that hasn't been answered or you still wanna raise one, feel free to pop it either in the Q&A or in the chat and include your email and we can get back to you. 
um, on that. But yeah, thanks. Um, so Steve, I'll hand it over to you now to um, wrap up the session. Thank you. Yeah, thanks um, very much, Catherine. <clears throat> you know, listening to this, you know, I'm struck by just how complex and difficult this task is really. I mean, if you think about the norms and standards around food systems and nutrition, I mean, they're moving very, very fast. We're trying not only, if you like, to focus in on nutrition impact, which is what ATNI has done, but the whole landscape's changing so that food systems have to reflect true cost of food, sustainability, environmental indicators, as well as health indicators. And I think if you if you accept that, you know, you have to see that the you know the root of effective accountability in the end is the actual impacts we're seeking. And to some extent, these are moving targets. It's very difficult. And but because you know, if you think about what the the idea of really measuring development impact is quite a new idea. I mean, it was the Millennium Development Goals in 2000 that were then universalized to the Sustainable Development Goals that are themselves really quite complex to measure. But I think, you know, as Gorgi made his point when he was commenting on ATNI in the, in the question, you know, what we're interested in here is not really relative performance. So, yeah, I mean, I think I would defend that ATNI, I think it's done an absolutely amazing job at creating more objective measures for nutrition performance. But yeah, you can certainly say, like you can in money at many other fields, education, you know, human rights, sometimes the population you're measuring are all playing in League One and Two, not the Premier League. You know, you want everyone to be raising their standards to a different level. And so, you know, whilst you're sort of recording how they're doing, everybody, you want to do better. So I think there are a couple of things really um, that, that come from this. And I hope that the organisations and companies on this call will kind of stick with the knitting and stay with this because it's very difficult. First is, it's so important to streamline the criteria. So you have um, no, <clears throat> it's not reasonable to think we can distill everything into one index. There are gonna be lots of indices, they have to be. There's one for investors, finance investors that I know ATNF's working on. There's the big companies, then there's a different model you need for SMEs, their accountability mechanisms and reporting perhaps need a lot less um, you know, public exposure because the companies are smaller and will be more worried about that at a country level. So I think the streamlining is really important and where the, <clears throat> the professionals, if you like, that are involved in this reporting work really need to try and line up the criteria so that for companies and others, it's easier to put together a kind of more coherent picture. That's the first thing. And secondly, I think the packaging and sum summation of this work is really important. So you have got GNR, for the nutrition for growth. And if I look at how GNR, the Global Nutrition Report, worked when it was first set up, and of course it was, you know, it was Lawrence Sadat, my boss now, who was really instrumental in that. It was able to take data, but it did it and used it in a kind of editorial way. It made judgment calls about the weight of different data and how you interpret it for getting a composite picture. And I think that's also something that's very important because you can, you can give a misleading picture if you just focus on one narrow indicator. Um, and you want to be able to give a more comprehensive picture of how the private sector is contributing, not just individual companies, private sector as a whole is contributing to the development challenges that the Food System Summit is trying to support. So if you look at the Food System Summit, there's talk of a countdown report. I know we are involved in some work with a number of you on that. Uh, Lancet will probably be the host for that. And there'll be a commentary issued around the Food System Summit on the sort of baseline and some of the indicators there. So I think, you know, it's really important that we, we don't, um, you know, kind of give up on this because in the end, uh, we need, however difficult it is, we need independent and objective evidence about how various players are moving to, you know, achieve the SDGs and other targets. And, you know, the private sector is really important. It, it continues to be um, underlooked, it's overlooked. It continues to be the, do the dominant narrative around most of the Food System Summit is still a public sector narrative. It's still heavily focused on, yeah, naturally it's a government, intergovernmental conference on what governments can do. But we know that the food system, if you think of it from the market trader through to the biggest multinationals and everybody in between, national, is really, which is, the, that's what's actually the muscle delivering the food that people buy. 
and consume every day when they live in a in a <clears throat> the end of long value chains with lots of processing or or so on whether they're kind of close to on farm production so i think this this has been a very good discussion but where it, it needs to go there needs to be this commitment of the players that are involved in um, the technical and specialized aspects of developing these measurement tools, uh, which obviously can't be the private sector themselves, because that's what's being measured. That's the first thing. And secondly, I think there has to be a wider political commitment to the importance of this, because otherwise, you know, it's easy for people to make lots of claims and, and, and project themselves, not just the private sector, but everybody uh, as something that's not being tested in the, in the real world. And hopefully, you know, the more these mechanisms make sense to people and can add up to an overall picture, the more it encourages the responsible uh, institutions at every level to do the best that they can to improve our food system, which we know is failing huge numbers of people on a daily basis, uh, probably more than half the population if you take the key nutrition indicators. So I think we should say thank you to the four institutions that have tried to keep this uh, you know, flame going and talk about these issues. And uh, everybody on the call, you know, there is a really important job to be done to improve these mechanisms and for the companies themselves to, to chime in with how, you know, how, it's, how to improve the collection of this data and make it more relevant. So I don't know whether that's a, a concluding comment is enough, uh, Luen. If so, we're, we look forward to staying in touch with you and um, carrying this work forward beyond the Food System Summit and the N4G. Thank you, everybody.